That's Nick. And that's Joseph. And today we're here to talk about Blonde, the fourth film directed by Andrew Dominic, uh, which premiered in competition at the 2022 Venice Film Festival, uh, just prior to Netflix releasing it theatrically and then on its streaming service, uh, September 28th, 2022. What are Andrew's other films? Uh, he's quite well known for The Assassination of Jesse James by the Coward by the coward Robert Ford from 2007. Is that with Brad Pitt? Yeah, which I hadn't seen and I just watched right before the Venice Film Festival. Oh, I was present. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and then you have seen his 2012 feature, Killing Them Softly, also starring Brad Pitt and James Gandolfini. I don't recall that. In 2012, which I remember uh, quite liking. Well, you saw this film at Venice mm -hmm. several weeks ago, mm -hmm. and we received a lot of comments to review it, which always means that people either really like it or they don't. Well, it had a very divisive response uh, in Venice. So, and I, I think we're probably on both sides of the spectrum of where we sit on it. Well, I don't want to pretend to be difficult. So I know that you really liked it. Yeah. I wasn't feeling it, but I don't think it's bad. I, I, I have opinions that I'll share, oh. but I can see why someone would really be into it. And one of your biggest reasons, if, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you feel like you really appreciate that the filmmaker was making some bold choices and doing something different. And I also like that. And there are many parts of the film I do like. I just wanted it to be something entirely different. Sure. So that's why I just... The film was also long as hell. And it felt long. Yeah, it, it, <laughs> it, it is long. Um, you know... Uh, Dominic has been developing this since, uh, I think, right around the time he started developing Killing Them Softly. So there are various women that have been attached to play Marilyn through its stages of development, such as Naomi Watts and Jessica Chastain, and finally settling on uh, Cuban actress Ana de Armas, which was a really interesting casting choice. And I actually really like what she does here. And I, I think it also helps elevate this as something that is certainly not a biopic, but uh, is an impression of Marilyn Monroe. I am also a fan of the novel that is based on by Joyce Carol Oates, published in 2000, uh, which of course takes, uh, as Joyce Carol Oates has done with other um, instances and people in the past, such as Chappaquiddick and uh, Jeffrey Dahmer, uh, has kind of made like a, a fantasy fiction version of reality. Uh, well, let's just tell the basic story. So it's a fictionalized sort of biopic about Marilyn Monroe. And we start with her as a child. We see that her mom is suffering from severe mental um, illness issues. So little Norma Jean is taken from her mother and placed in foster care. And then we fast forward to like the 40s mm -hmm. when now Marilyn Monroe is like a pinup girl. And then her career quickly evolves marries uh, Joe DiMaggio, marries Arthur Miller, gets pregnant a few times, terminates the pregnancy a few times, or loses the baby once, I believe, and then terminates the pregnancy two other times, perhaps. We see a lot of, like, fetuses and uteruses and some vagina. Some, it's a some, lot. Uh, vaginal POV shots that are very infamous already. Yeah. We see a lot of misogyny, some sexual assault. We see her struggle with... I think this movie should have been called Daddy Issues, mm -hmm. really. Mm -hmm. But struggling with issues pertaining to her father who left her as a child, who she, who she never knew. Um, an, a, a problem with like addiction to me like pain medication, perhaps, or mm -hmm. some sort of pills. And then ultimately dying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. it. Oh, overdosing, yes. Okay. In, in 1962. So... And, and then we get a lot of references to her most, like, it's like the greatest hits, like, literally and figuratively, because her first husband was abusive to her, but also, like, her big movie roles, like, all of that's featured. Not all of it. I think there's some strange uh, elements that, that are that are left out, including, like, her final film, which Arthur Miller wrote for her, The Misfits, is completely neglected. But I mean, like, Seven Year Ish, Gentlemen Prefer Blondes, um... We see her the in Niagara. Niagara. They, they include uh, an, in, an interesting um, element of Don't Bother to Knock, where she plays the psychotic babysitter. We see um, her with the president. We don't see her sing Happy Birthday. It's a much, it, it's a much less uh, glossy version of her relationship with the president. JFK, uh, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I don't know where to begin, except maybe I should start with, uh, what did I like? 
I'm not bothered by, I was reading about the film and people are really bothered by Anna de Armas and her accent. I honestly, I, I really had to focus to even catch a little bit of that, but it didn't bother me at all because what Norma Jean was doing with Marilyn Monroe was a character and Is that was role? also an accent. So yeah. it's like, well, they both had accents playing Marilyn Monroe then. So that didn't bother me. I think Anna de Armas is obviously beautiful. And as Marilyn, she does look like her. In many moments, she really, really resembles her. I don't think she captures the magic of Marilyn Monroe. Um, but if you're going to get a photocopy, she's probably the best photocopy I've seen of Marilyn Monroe. I, outside I would, of like a drag queen. I would. Because I have seen drag queens do her better. But anyway, go ahead. <laughs> I was going to say, I would agree with that. Uh, but also, you kind of settle into her performance well enough where it's just fine. And I much prefer this to something like... White Michelle Williams in My Week with Marilyn, which is kind of a terrible film. And that is set around um, the filming of The Prince and the Showgirl, which doesn't even get a, a reference here. Uh, but Marilyn, uh, as uh, an avatar for Norma Jean, uh, it has been explored also in other Marilyn iterations. There's a television film from the late 90s where Ashley Judd plays Norma Jean Baker and Mira Sorvino is Marilyn. And I think that's another interesting way to approach uh, kind of the juxtaposition of, you know, these these two personalities in one woman just to keep this moving i'm just going through my notes so i just thought what i wanted this film to be because i don't know there's something so weird about people writing like it's almost like fan fiction because that's what this book is like this is not i just kept thinking like who's gonna watch this movie it's either like older people who probably grew up you know either with their parents watching marilyn monroe movies and their friend very familiar with her. So I'm thinking like, oh, imagine like a 60 plus per person watching this NC-17 rated movie. They're not going to be into it at all. Then imagine like younger people watching it and thinking like, oh, this was her life. I I have some concerns and I, I don't know that it is fair to put it on the filmmaker, but I just think like rewriting history seems like an odd thing to I don't, do for I don't, I don't think it's rewriting history I think that is the, that is poetic license as uh, in taking a, using uh, weaving a, po a public figure into a certain poetic license I think should be possible for any artist to do it's on the onus of the audience to realize like we're not supposed to be watching reality but I would much rather watch something like what Andrew Dominic is doing here than another cookie cutter uh, mm. Hollywood story like Judy you know that the, the audience you should never be watching a, a narrative feature and thinking that's reality oh well i i don't disagree with you and you know i believe strongly in like people sort of uh learning where to find the truth and certainly it's not like a hollywood movie but i st i i don't know i think it's easy to say all that until it were you what if everyone's running around talking about your life and filling in the gaps and like total bullshit like well then i would have the agency to say something about it but um that, that's what makes it worse like <laughs> and she and she doesn't but i think that this is trying to be kind of an empathetic portrayal of you think it's empathetic yeah for sure oh you don't feel bad for her I feel bad that this movie... I felt bad thinking that if that lady came back from the dead and saw this movie, she would not be happy. Well, you know... <laughs> That's what I was thinking watching it. I don't think there was a lot of pleasure in being Marilyn Monroe. And I think that that was the consensus about her even at the, when she was still alive. Um, you know, personally, my own maternal grandmother who I was very close to was kind of obsessed with Marilyn Monroe. But I was even aware at a small age, from a young age watching these Monroe movies and my grandmother being like, well, she was, uh, you know, had a terrible life. There was always this tragedy of Marilyn. And it almost was like that was the solace for not being able to have a life like Marilyn. Moving for, on. For, for housewives. I per think se. that what, I don't disagree with you, although I, the whole poetic license thing, I don't know. It just seems real murky because then we get into like the news and how the news twists the truth. And I feel like this is not too far off. Like, oh, so you're saying that we should be allowed to take historical figures and just say whatever we want about them because it's Hollywood. Well, in the context, in the context of a narrative feature that is fiction, yes. In the context of new, a news source, no. Yeah, but I mean, the, the, the film, you know, no one's saying like, hey, everyone, this is not real. This is just an interpretation. So I agree with you. But then as someone who is aware, I'm sitting here like, do I need this? Like, I would have much preferred they just make a, like a fictional story about a woman in the 1940s who becomes a star and like all the issues she had. It didn't need to be Marilyn Monroe. But 
What I was going to say is if we want to do this movie with this real life person, I feel like we should have stuck with what we know is true and what I think are the best moments in the film is that we know for sure that lady was objectified and abused. Mm -hmm. And just the, t like, I can't even imagine what it would be like to know that every man I bump into wants to, like, handle me like a piece of meat. And then because you're an actor, they think that they and have... And then because some people have literally paid for you, they really do think they have control of you. And there are scenes where we see her being sexually assaulted. There is a scene in particular... Well, there are two. One when she's filming the Seven Year Itch and that scene where the air is blowing up her skirt. And we see all the men in the like on set and their reaction to her, which feels very violent. And then later on, we see her show up at some premiere and we see all these men in like the paparazzi or the audience um, with like the Snapchat filter on their face with the big mouth. I thought that that should have been what this movie was like really focused on the objectification and made it almost like a horror film. Like this one woman and what she must, like what life must have been like was a horror film. And then you can extrapolate from that, that it probably did lead to some unhappy relationships and, you know, chemical well, abuse. Well, you get, we get the most famous ones like Bobby Cannavale as I would say, not a very good Joe DiMaggio. And then Adrian Brody as a, I, I, quite a likable Arthur Miller. I, I like his introductory scene to her uh, in this. But we're skipping... There, You know, Marilyn encompasses a lot. There, There's a lot of information about her. And we skip over like a first marriage that she basically had to uh, walk into as a teenager to stay in California because her foster parents had moved out of state. Like, the, Well, it's fiction, so it, maybe she didn't get married. You know what I mean? That's the problem, I feel like. Well, what, <laughs> where the, the greatest divergence from reality is her three-way relationship that the film starts oh, with. Oh, that really bothered With me. Edward G. Robinson Jr. and Charles Chapman. Chaplin Jr. played by uh, Xavier Samuel and uh, Evan Williams. Uh, but that's in Oates' book as well. And I remember that was when reading the novel is what I had the most questions about. Like, were these people real? And they were. These were both real figures. And did I, I don't know that uh, I, that's making a very broad leap suggesting that she was in a three-way relationship with them. It's not the three-way that bothered me. It was the, 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 the characterizations and the performances. I just, it was a really hard section of the film for me to sit through. Sure. But um, we need to keep going. So I thought her wig looked really nice. Anna looked, Darmus, I think, looks great. Yeah, yeah she looks great. Um, the, the wig work is very good because you can tell that they styled the wig so it looks like she... It's very well done. I think so I it's, do want to say I think that. it's very well done, and they show they inject her into actual sequences from films, such as uh, in Some Like It Hot, opposite Tony Curtis. I, she looks she looks a lot like. I her. wanted to talk about things I did like. So we see her like in an acting class, mm -hmm. and it just immediately cuts to her in an acting class, like crying out of control, mm -hmm. like she's invoking some experience and then the acting teacher has to calm her down i thought that was really well done that had the tone of what i wanted um i while i didn't like her interactions with the two guys i did really like um there's a scene where they're having sex with her mm -hmm. and then it's like transposed over a waterfall mm -hmm. there's some really really impressive oh, visuals the, uh cinematographer chase irvin i think does a fantastic job of weaving like actual very famous photographs and contextualizing it throughout the um cinematography of the, the film. cat is assaulting us oh my god <laughs> um i already mentioned the seven year itch scene and then the scene with her showing up at the premiere um i also think so we see her makeup artist at one point like norma jean's upset and he's telling her like i'll go get Marilyn. basically meaning like give me a minute i'll turn you into her mm -hmm. and i thought again that is what i wanted and i haven't seen that movie you already referenced where the two actors play um, norma jean and Marilyn, but i we, we really don't ever see the two people because we, without makeup on, like there, there isn't much of a transformation in, in this movie. Like she always kind of looks the same, even though he's saying, let me turn you into her, which is also partially psychological, right? Mm -hmm. I, that being said, I did really like that moment. Uh, that's Dennis O'Hare, of course, playing her uh, stylist, makeup artist. Uh, what? You, did, you uh, comment you didn't like Julianne Nicholson as Gladys, the mother. That's my next note. I did not need this 17-minute opening of her as a child. Like, I just... See, I did like that because uh, it's, you know, it set a, a, 
uh, amidst this backdrop of fires and it looks uh, great in the Hollywood Hills. It looks great, but it almost and the street they're driving up to is like the street we live. Like so, that was cool, right? But it almost feels like Marilyn is this this figure that is forged in hellfire almost. And I like that Dominic had a phrase about referring to Marilyn as like she is now like the dust from an exploded star that has uh, you know become absorbed in the ether. Or some I'm paraphrasing most of that, but I I, I like that she, you know that she was created out of all this. You know all, all this trauma and yet has uh, is reflecting back on us i think he also referred to her as like it's the light from a dying star we're still seeing that light but she's dead my biggest takeaway from the opening is that the mom seemed a little too crazy but not like it was kind of laughable it was almost like mommy dearest like faye dunaway as joan crawford crazy it wasn't like creepy disturbing I, and then I, the little girls acting but i disagree I, because i thought julianne's performance talking to that officer trying to drive through this inferno when she says she says some line like i wish you could kill me like, yeah but that's like 30 seconds okay of a 17 minute i, I do agree when she's trying to tell the officer and i then, thought that and then even good. when the officer is like you know i think it it was good I, I just think overall my impression of the mom, because we see her two more times because she's been transferred to a mental health facility in Norwalk, California, mm -hmm. and we see Marilyn Norma go to visit her mom. And even then, the mom, that portrayal seemed kind of like, oh, she's playing crazy. Sure. Which I thought was kind of You know, uh, tidbit, Marilyn and part of her foster care was in Hawthorne. Oh, wow. Child. Wow, I didn't know that. Um, they, they didn't tell us that when we bought our house over there. No, nope, um, sure didn't. The other thing that I... I didn't, I'm, the abortion scene, the, her talking to her fetus more than once. Sure. The, the visual. Well, she's the, also sat, like, imagine talking to her father, played by Tig Runyon, who's in this Orson Welles rosebud mode, but yeah. That, I don't. Sure, <laughs> sure. I, I'm not saying it all works. I'm just, I like the uh, brazenness of the entire production. Okay, the dialogue. There's a lot of dialogue that I th thought was laughable. Hearing it, her speak it, sure. other characters. I just feel like when you put all of the things together that are kind of crunchy, I don't know how you could say it's like an excellent movie. So that's where we disagree. But there is a lot about it that I do like. Again, yeah, I, I don't think it's perfect as most films are not, but I think it has way more going for it than there There are detractions. Even seeing it a second time and talking, the talking to the fetus really does take you out of it. Uh, I do not really understand why this is rated NC-17. And I think because Americans are really puritanical about the female body because the vaginal POV shots, those aren't, from an actual vagina. Uh, and also, I, I like that that is the simulation of what the public thinks that the access they have to her celebrity is inside and out, like taken to the ultimate extreme. Well, I mean, sure. But I also, that was my next note. I don't quite understand why it's NC-17. The, the, the vagina scene you're talking about, we're looking from the inside out. So that could have literally been beef curtains. I don't know why that's like a big deal. Then I th again, we, because we Americans do see are well, okay. Then uh, we do see her performing oral sex on the president, but you don't see any penis. So no. again, I was. And we, we do see a lot of breast. Oh, we do. Well, we see her mom's vagina briefly, but it's just like her just but standing N there. NC seventeen. These are these are human body parts. Okay, but that's not the point. I mean, we have rules for what makes. I'm questioning the NC-17 rating because I don't know... The, like, I was surprised to realize that what we saw falls within those guidelines. I'm not challenging the guidelines. They are what they are. I was just surprised to, to witness this movie and think that it fell into NC-17 guidelines. Because um, it doesn't feel overtly sexual at all. I think this movie is so zany that I almost wanted it to be, like, over-the-top crazy. Like, and I'm not trying to be funny. I feel like Britney Spears could have played Marilyn Monroe. That would have really sent it. <laughs> I don't think I would have enjoyed that. Oh, uh, kind of uh, like another scene that I think worked really well and was in the tone that I wanted was when the Secret Service uh, carries her ass off the plane to go see the president. Mm -hmm. And they literally toss her around like a rag doll. Mm -hmm. And then the president is like, all he wants her there for is to help him ejaculate. And then they boot her ass out. And, and before they even boot her out, like she either ODs or... He hits her. I don't know what happened. It, well, and obviously they. This film is uh, 
the, the conjectures that she that wasn't his first ejaculation that day with a woman based on the lipstick on the wine glass in the room and he's on the phone defending his actions uh, and accusations against other women and there were at the Venice premiere there were a lot of people laughing because as JFK ejaculates there's some 19 19- 60s sci-fi movie again playing. it just feels campy like it is it, it this is i feel like this movie is going to end up being not at the level of showgirls but i feel like no. years from now people are gonna like it because it's so ridiculous sure but i really like the score from uh, nick cave and warren ellis uh who dominic dominic directed a documentary about nick cave recently uh be, and it's it's got this twin peaks uh, Battle of Menti vibe that really kind of in my mind aligns Marilyn with Laura Palmer that I really I, I really dig that vibe. This lady stayed pregnant. I feel like every other scene is her like where's pregnant. The, where's a fetus or, shot or, or, or because if she's not pregnant, like feeling that she's pregnant, we see the fetus or she's getting rid of the baby. So yeah. Oh, and Another I- scene that I thought worked well and was in the tone I wanted was towards the end. There's like a night vision scene mm-hmm. where we see some man in the corner and she's discombobulated. Again, I think this would have worked so well as almost like a horror film, and it's and 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 the evil entity is the objectification this woman endured. Up until she died, like so. So that's what I wanted from from this, and there is quite a bit of that. Probably like thirty minutes worth. If you crop that all together, it'd be a great short film. But everything else feels crazy as hell, like laughable to me. So that's why I wasn't feeling it. Okay, I I, I really appreciate it and really like this film, and you know would much rather see the envelope being pushed in this direction as far as cinema goes. Uh, if you're interested in watching a film from the 50s that was vaguely already based on Marilyn uh, and Norma Jean, Kim Stanley starring in The Goddess is uh, is recommended. Um, anyway, but yeah, I, I, I liked how it looked. I think a lot of time and effort and care uh, went into this. Um, yeah. What would you give it? I, uh, in my review from Venice, I gave it four and I will maintain that rating. Wow. I would give it two and a half because I'm in the middle. Sure. That's fair. Yeah. I, I don't think people will like it. And I think there are people who somehow really like it. Um, yeah. So. Oh, I mean, other people, I don't know that I would compare it to Malik, but uh, it was earning uh, comparisons to uh, Malik, maybe Kubrick. But to me, this is more, and I'm a huge fan of David Lynch. Uh, so that is a badge of honor for me. This is kind of in Lynchian territory as far as biopics might go, but um I think if the film uh, piqued your interest at all, I, re- I highly recommend reading the book by J- Joyce Carol Oates. Hit the thanks button. Listen to our podcast. Bye. <laughs>